was always drawn to a lot of things in your playing, but the main focus was always, I was so in awe of your ability to play um, deep melodic lines. Uh, and and no matter where how complex the, the chord sequence is, you always find those notes that stick out and that take me as a listener with you. And I was wondering how you worked on that. And uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to find you know juicy notes, mm -hmm. the notes that seem right, you know, and then leave the other ones hanging on the tree. You know that yeah. you may you don't want right now, but you might pick later. You yeah. Know? So that's the. I had a great teacher, uh, Ted Dunbar. Yeah, who was you know had a he had a, a lot of pedagogy in his his teaching. Everything was kind of organized into different things. But he really made the guitar player, all his students, learn the scales mm. uh, to learn the fingerboard, and that mm. was the thing. You got to know your scales. That's the way you learn how the fingerboard is laid out. But when you play music and you improvise, the last thing you want to think about is scales. Right. So what you need to do is take these scales, which you're learning anyway, and organizing the fingerboard, and kind of organizing harmony. In your, as you learn about it, but it's very important that you get to know each note of the scale and learn how to make a phrase around each note as if you're, as if it's a word and you're making a sentence around right. that word. So that it almost that, that that note has a meaning to you. Mm -hmm. You use it in a phrase, and uh, it's not about finding the perfect phrase and then using that phrase every time you want to feature that note. It's more just about really getting to learn sounds. Of the and not really thinking about it as a scale, but just a collection of notes, like a family. Mm. And then you go outside of the family, and you can bring in other notes from from outside the family that just make it make it uh, even more colorful. You're not, you're not you're not limited by the scale, but that's the way you learn to organize, you know, and playing on sound. So he, he was always that stuck with me a lot about making phrases that are about a certain note in the scale. So when I learn songs, I kind of try to think, oh, that phrase is about this note. Mm -hmm. and, and there's many great examples of it in, in the melodies that we try to learn from all through music history, all the great melodies, and they're just like the way they use notes in support and notes that are featured. You know, that, right. that concept stuck with me. So that I've worked on it, it's just kind of working on my ears and learning what those notes, you know, mean to me and kind of how they, how they're, you know, how to work with them. Like, a, like you might try to work, be a, be a chef and learn how to work with certain ingredients. And you keep trying new things, but trying to bring out the ingredient you know, as best you can. But a lot of lines and stuff, I just I studied the guys that sound melodic to me. You know? Yeah. Can you name yeah. some of them? Well, I mean, well, this goes back to before I was even into jazz, but in, in the world of jazz, I mean, the great melody players like Louis Armstrong, Lester Young. Miles, of course, and then of course to be Charlie Parker and Sonny Rollins and right. Coltrane, all with beautiful melodies. And so it's just about hearing how guys use these this language to mm. you know to express themselves. But everything melody, you know, all things melody. Stevie Wonder, the right. Beatles, you know, classical music. But you can't really separate melody from harmony, right? I mean, I feel like your melodies are full of. Yeah. Information for well, that's yeah. If, that's, you, if I would just listen to your lines, I would know the changes to songs. You know, yeah, that's that's well. You're trying to be harmonically specific and be clear to a certain degree when you play, but then <clears> the fun is also how you abstract that. Right. You know, you can be less obvious if you know how to be obvious. Maybe to me, so it's kind of maybe going more abstract from something that is, you know. Obviously, the extreme would be just delineating changes, but you don't mm. want to just run up and down the chords, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. or something like that. But to have your lines informed by what the harmony is, and mm. also try to stretch a little bit and you know, look for look for the interesting notes. You know. mm. But yeah, melody you can't separate from harmony. You also can't separate from rhythm. You know? So yeah. that's the thing too. It's all about placement and you know, melodic rhythm, where the notes are in the in the bar line. That's the whole thing about bird and mm. that. Rhythmic thing by where the notes are in the phrase, you know, how they 
um, leans on certain things. So. You've mentioned Sonny Rollins, and you yeah. actually played with him. And I'm, I'm wondering what kind of lessons you got from him. Is there any, oh, any yeah, instructions that he gave you, or um, that you still remember? Or, or, um, well, I mean, I got to do like 30 gigs with him, like wow. between uh, 2010, where I just stubbed on a few gigs, and then 2011, part of 2012. So we did about 30 gigs, and yeah, I never got over the fact that oh my God, Sonny Rollins, <laughs> yeah. he's like. It's five feet away from me, and mm -hmm. I, was, I was just like, it, 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 it was, I was amazed. In terms of instruction that he gave me, it was just more like he really wanted a conversation. I think he was aware that right. he, he intimidated people, too. You know, like, <laughs> but it was just like, he just, you know, don't worry about stepping on my toes. Just like, mm -hmm. just don't be polite. Just, you know, of course, you know, when you're in the presence of certain, you would know, yeah. be polite. Or, but that's what he wanted, and... and a lot of times he would kind of keep playing when he wasn't soloing, and, and the main thing to learn was just to, okay, he's not going to stop playing. Just just yeah. jump in and become part of the of the conversation. And the more you can converse and get into that with him, the more the more he liked it. So huh. it was really just a thing of like, you know, yeah, just kind of just talk, you know. Yeah. And, but you're talking with like the oracle of Delphi, you yeah, know. Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of yeah. like, well, you have to learn how to try to be as relaxed as possible. I just but, saw, I saw a video today of you guys playing together, uh, Don't Stop the Carnival, mm -hmm. which is, that was, that, that was like, numbers. Yeah. Don't yeah. Stop uh, was uh, supposed to be the topic, I think, because it was like, 20 uh, minutes yeah. of 20 a flat minutes, turnaround, that's it, that's and I was wondering, one, four, five, <laughs> there, there, six, was, yeah. Yeah, there was one moment where, okay, is, is this Pete solo now, or is it still, uh, yeah. well, okay. That's right, that's what he kept, yeah. he kept, you know, and there was no chordal instrument for me, so he kept. Yeah, we keep playing, and that was yeah. you know, that was really fun. I mean, the deepest thing was at a at a kind of a rehearsal for a drummer who was going to be subbing on a couple of gigs, and we're trying to get this calypso right. And it wasn't really coming together, and it was you know a little bit tense. And finally, you know, Sonny was saying things to the drummer that you know were abstract, and I was kind of like, well, I, I'm not sure how he would necessarily change what he's doing after hearing, that. but mm. he knew that it wasn't there yet. And finally, he turned around and started feeling good. Sonny was really, you know, he stopped playing. Yeah, that's it. That's the feeling we want. That's 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 good. That's 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 good. That's where it's at. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the feeling we want. And the drummer really wanted to, uh, you know, he was so happy to get some positive yeah, feedback, yeah. and he really wanted to. He was so reverent, as we all were. You know, I was of Sonny, like also like to, to you know, want him to be happy. So he said, you know, now on this kind of clip, so. The drummer asked him, "Would the snare drum be open or closed?" It's a valid question. You know, what's the what's the proper sound? And Sonny kind of just got there for a good. I mean, 20, 30 seconds, which felt like a long time. Yeah. Because we wasn't sure what was coming next. And he said, "You know, if the music feels right and uh, everything is cool, you know, you can do what you want. You're here to make decisions, mm. and you know, that's 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 what jazz musicians are supposed to do. You mm. decide what you should do." Yeah. And if you're playing for the music, it's all it's right. Yeah. If you believe it's right, yeah. that was the, I mean, I'm, I'm ad living on what he said, but that was the basic thing. And, and the thing that stuck with me, and this is verbatim, he said, if you think about it, you couldn't be in a more of a privileged position to be able to, you know, to make decisions. And that that struck me because, you know, all that. I mean, I was this was almost ten years ago now, but it's been a long time trying to learn how to play and I'm, yeah. whatever, I'm doing it and playing and feeling like. You know, this is um, improvising was important to me. I didn't want to play the same old things, but I never heard it put in the sense of like, we're lucky that we can choose what we play. We take, take it for granted. We yeah, play jazz, absolutely. You know, he said, uh, he also said, you know, there's great musicians and symphonies all around the world that have to play what's put in front of them. He was like, you know, we, we can we make up our own things. Yeah. And, and that's incredible privilege to do that. So, of course, with the privilege comes responsibility, like Absolutely. you have to play yeah. for the music, but, but that was a deep thing that put something in another perspective for me beyond style or you trying to play what's hip, what's not hip. It's really like, this is the idea. This is mm. the concept behind improvising is that you know, we get to decide. We're making decisions. And right. It should be based on a deeper thing than what you think you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because that mm -hmm. was the question. That's probably why you went there. Yeah, what yeah, am I yeah. supposed to do? What's the right thing to do? Mm. More important than being right is to be in touch with 
the idea of, you know, I'm making decisions up here. So mm -hmm. you own those decisions. You take right. responsibility for your decisions and you, you know, that's what it's about. So that was a pivotal moment where mm -hmm. it kind of hit me like this is, this is what, this is what it provides me needs, you know. Yeah. Wow, that's deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was beautiful. And, and just to hear him every night, just like every, just the audacity, like you could just play stuff that was just like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, just like searching and, and, and of course, I mean, Sonny taught us all how to play, like how to interpret a standard, how to, right. you know, so many things about like, you know. Do you have a favorite record? Of his, I think there's a lot of them. I mean, I have ones that kind of hit me at certain pivotal moments, of course, the bridge and, right. and uh, but a lot of like Luke's time, of course, and uh, mm -hmm. Saxophone Colossus, I listened to a lot. All those, mm -hmm. and, and, and all the stuff with Clifford Brown, I love, I love oh, those yeah. records. And, uh, two, the two records on Blue Note, especially Volume 2 with J.J. Johnson. Mm -hmm. A couple of tunes with Monk. And yeah, that's the rest uh, of Horace Silver. Yeah, Volume Mr. 2. Mr. Rioso, they play, right? Mr. Rioso yeah. and Reflections. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah that's some of my favorite. That's song. killing, yeah. Monk is great. How was it to get, uh, did you ask Bob Crenshaw any, any questions, like yeah. how to, to Function in that group? Yeah, or? well, it was like, Bradshaw was, I mean, he was so beautiful. I mean, he was the greatest guy. And uh, mm. I mean, he went back so far with Sonny, too. It was really, you know, they had such a history together. And, uh, but but Cranshaw was, I mean, he would hold it down. He wasn't, yeah. you know, that was his whole thing, was the function of the bass and the groove. That's what he was about. So between the, you know, there was two very strong things to try to get in between, you know. And... Uh, Yeah, I don't think I don't think it was always about trying to chase Sonny out into the other keys he would go into as much as just <coughs> try to make that sound like maybe the way he he would hear it against us against the sound as opposed mm. to just like you know trying to play with what I think he's going to play or mm -hmm. follow him out because he would play very strong melodic things, but then he would just kind of play all these like kind of phrases in parentheses, you know, yeah. of, and they'd be in any key, mm -hmm. very chromatic and very abstract, so yeah. I think it was about trying to acknowledge those things were there without trying to, you to, know, to follow oh, this is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, and hold it down and, and, and just lock in with Bob, because that was yeah. follow his bass line, you know. But still, how do you make it so interesting, 20, playing 20 minute A flat oh, around, you well, know? Oh, that's hard. That's because just, it was... Super interesting. I was really? like, okay, yep. what's the next wow. chord that he's yeah. going to play, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I imagine you doing that because that was kind of his signature tune after of a while, course, right? yeah. in the later yeah. years. So uh, you would pl have to play that 30 times yeah. with him. Yeah, pretty so much. We played a lot of you, calypsos, yeah. So how did you go about it? Oh, man. Well, I, I mean, you just, it's, uh, I think his whole thing with playing things long was just to kind of get past the wall of the things that, kind of just do, yeah. to get past that and yeah. go to some other place. Like he would kind of, instead of trying to avoid certain things, he would just kind of play his stuff and then reach past, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of to do with, with uh, George Coleman is like that too. He plays long, mm -hmm. you know. Not that they're playing uninteresting things in the beginning and then they get to the interesting stuff. It's always, but the, just the idea to keep going and keep searching is like, I mean, I think it just comes from them having lots of ideas, <laughs> lots of things that they want to try. You know, that like recording that. of of Sonny Rollins playing 40 minutes of four in in Copenhagen. Oh my God, that's crazy. like yeah, it it doesn't yeah, stop. No, it it's, doesn't it's, stop. Uh, it just keeps on going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I was feeling like, wow, we have been playing this a long time, <laughs> and what are people like? Are they in a trance? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not experiencing, you know what we're experiencing by playing it. So I, I just wonder about that. And like yeah. when I play my own gigs, I always feel conscious about, you know, playing too much. But I mean, I think mean, just with charisma, like, like that, that they have, they can just like, I don't keep playing. Just try to find some other stuff. Mm. They just, and I think it's also like, you're playing so long and you still have your strength. It just becomes a, that's the way to get into your, To your group is just to play through the conscious stuff into right. subconscious. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, when I listen to guitar players, especially maybe in the, the 
say guitar players from the last 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. you know, that generation. I hear a lot of songs in E and A and D, uh -huh. G and B, well, you know. Guitar keys. Yeah. yeah. Right. When I hear you and your compositions, I don't seem to hear those keys so the often. Keys? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I hear you playing in F minor and C, you know, yeah. of course you always also go there, but uh, right. I kind of feel like you're um, in terms of choices of keys or maybe also, you know, you feel more to me like a home player. And uh, I was wondering, yeah. if, is that a conscious thing of you? or Not really, but I do, I mean, I listen to a lot of horn music, so mm. I mean, kind of get thinking of how certain things sound in certain keys, but not just horns, it's also, it's also the bass and just the sounds of certain keys. Yeah. I don't know, I mean, I don't really think about it all that much. Yeah. I just try to, I, I had written some tunes and changed the key mm -hmm. to kind of find like what I thought was a better character for it, but yeah. I think those open string keys are really more for writing things that are around the guitar. Yeah. You know, maybe centered around guitaristic things, and I just, I don't really write that much in that way, so. Mm -hmm. But I'm really into open strings, and especially the way Jim Hall used open strings, which was in the flat keys. Like, mm -hmm. he would use the open strings, they'd be ringing out, and they'd be the color tone. So yeah. Jim Hall's playing, you know, turn around in D flat. Mm make them all dominant seventh chords, you have G, B, and E on top of right. you know, one, six, two, five, and they're all yeah. tension notes, so you get a different sound when the open strings are, are those, uh, those dissonant notes. You yeah, know, so. I wanted to say the same thing yeah. with you, actually. I feel yeah. like you have incorporated the open strings in a very personal uh, way to yeah. your voices, and that way I think you found new voicing yeah. and added that yeah. to the vocabulary. It's hard yeah. to say. People, a lot of people have been playing guitar for a long time. Yeah, sure, everybody's played, stumbled across pretty much everything by now. But it, yeah, it's a way, <clears throat> it's a way you use it, and, and you know, just trying to uh, use the open strings to create some some tension or mm. just some kind of inter intervals that you can't because guitar is limited. It's not like piano where you can just yeah. you want to add another note to that chord. Just, there's another finger there that you can, yeah. you can use to do it. Guitar is really about you know. Finding little, you know, more more things to do with the, the way the intervals play off each other in, in the voice. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. more like Monk. That was a big inspiration. Like the way he would play voices were just about this is an interval of a seventh, and then yeah. above the seventh, it's a tenth. That's yeah. the chord. It's yeah. not anything else in between because then you're messing up those big intervals. So yes. and, and Monk to have for Monk to have the restraint to do that, or just to really say, no, I like the way these tones vibrate, yeah. and not to put his hands down like most piano players do, mm. it was just like, show that he was thinking about that. But on the guitar, you have to reduce, you have no choice. So, yeah. you're trying to reduce in the, in the hippest ways, and <laughs> you know, and Monk was a great example of like, yeah, you don't need a lot of notes in the chord, it's about, yeah. and then he would phrase the notes in the chords differently too, mm. and that's kind of technique non-velocity technique, but mm -hmm. the technique of how to play a chord and you know, make it bring out a certain note in the chord. So mm. Open strings do that because they ring differently, so it's almost like you hit it in a different way. It's Absolutely. got a different character. So, yeah. I feel like you, you have worked a lot on Monk's music because you, when you yeah. play his music, it really, yeah, really shines so. through. Still working on it. Yeah. For sure. How do you work on it? Just by playing the tunes and trying to you know, find the little things in it to make it, you know, just to be respectful of the tune, not to play it just like melody and changes, of course, you kind mm. of miss the point a lot of times if you just do that, but find little little things in there, but at the same time, not just try to play, you know, monk-like things, but try to get, because like, the great horn players that played with Monk, you know, Sonny, Charlie Rouse, mm -hmm. Johnny Griffin, Train, they all yeah. they all played themselves, they're not going to like, yeah. you know, but to, to play yourself and then to play the character of the composition, you know, Monk creates, you know, presents that challenge to you. you know. What's the latest uh, Monk tune that you've learned? The latest Monk tune I've learned? I don't know. I kind of keep going back and trying to... Relearn. You know, relearn. Yeah. yeah, Light Blue, I'm still, you know, we played yep. that one the other night. I haven't played it in a long time. I, like, I love that one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm overdue to, like, tackle something one actually yeah like a 
trinkle tinkle I've messed with, but I can't yeah. I can't seem to get it like yeah you know I found ready. his original sheath I can <laughs> really he yeah. wrote it out that's funny because apparently he would never show people the music yeah I mean, he would just like make them learn it yeah, it's <laughs> finally finding its way through the internet I, wow I think, yeah. Really, really, wow yeah yeah that's a hard one but yes. uh, it's brilliant. Mm. it's brilliant I want to get your perspective on something I talked to Larry about and that's the lesson that or the lessons that Larry took with Keith Jarrett uh -huh. and on one of the lessons he taught me he brought you or he maybe it was a couple of lessons and no, just once just once he was very uh, sad that uh, Keith liked you wow. <laughs> so much and it was really uh, he, that told was, yeah, he told you about that yeah he told me about so hilarious. I want to get that's not really true that's not really true because Larry was a student and yeah. uh, you know I was I was just there kind of as a as a guest, so there was mm. no. You know, I think he was holding me to the same. St I, I couldn't play at all in those days. I don't know, you know. <laughs> that that that's 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 the truth. So he was being kind, but uh, it was a great experience. I mean, just to be around, you know, to be in his presence for you know, an hour and a half, a couple hours. And just right. Played some songs for him, and then uh, we talked a lot about stuff, and uh, we all played one together. I mean, he had two pianos in the studio. Yep. And we played in your own sweet way. Right. And uh, it was a pretty crazy experience. I mean, yeah. two pianos and a guitar was yeah. know, it's an unusual, but it was just like, hey, this is cool, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, you know, his music sure was, had a big effect on I mean, I think, you know, I'll say if he only ever made Facing You, that would be right. enough yeah. to just make him one of the heaviest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's ever it's my favorite so, of his, too. So, yeah. You know, just, it, but then there's so much other great. That's, mm. that's you know really not that only ten years or so before that he started playing with or twelve or so before I started playing with the trio and really right. got back into standards. But uh, I do keep going back to that one and you know and the stuff with Dewey Redman and oh, Paul yeah. Motion and Charlie Hayden I love that group too. His writing, yeah, really unique. You know, mm. but uh, yeah, that was just a kind of a surreal early brush with like a super heavy guy that so few <laughs> people have really had any kind of so up, I, up close yeah, yeah that's why I just was it was I guess it happened but you know it's so long ago now and, mm. and really like it just seemed like a, you know did you give any advice uh, to me yeah I, stuff that you should try or um, um, it was it was really Larry's lesson mm. you know and I think he, he was talking with both of us when he said it's really important to play lives that have dynamic you know, mm. that you're thinking about just the way you would speak a sentence you know not intoning all the words in the sentence the same way the yeah. phrase is like takes air and there should be a feeling of you know, the phrase having a having an arc of some <clears> kind <throat> just just to make it more human more 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 lyrical sound mm. that, was, that was a point that I remember him, him making and yeah yeah, he does that. You know. so I was kind of like, yeah. yeah, of course. It's, but uh, it was really, yeah, he's a really serious guy too. Like very, I think he felt very misunderstood in a way, and I kind of felt like, you know, wow, it's, you know, I thought he'd be happier. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, he's got to, you know, doing his thing all over the world. Yeah. Revered, and he was still a pretty young guy. This was 1985. Because like mm. I was thinking, because my last, yeah, 85, 86. Wow. We were young. So, mm -hmm. but how old was he? I mean, mid 40s then. Yeah, I guess he wasn't so. Yeah. Really, you know, but he had already had such a, you know, made such an impact. So, you're going to play with the trio and you've been yeah. playing together for almost 30 years or 30 years? This is, yeah, this is the 30th. Yeah, is we it? started playing around 1988. Can you name, uh, so. like, a couple of virtues that you've kind of picked up from those guys that you get, get wow. to learn from Bill and, and Larry. Yeah, well, just the level of, you know, intensity, consistent creativity. So it's a great feeling to play with the same guys for so long because while you're comfortable with them, you also feel like these guys have heard all my shit by now. So yeah. I really, every night, I, you, you got to look for something. It's not about mm. just, oh, we got to do the show. There's no show, you know. Yeah. The show for them, in terms of my perspective is that they're always 
find new stuff. Even if we play a song that we haven't played for almost 30 yeah. years, and there are some that we still do, but it's, it's always a freshness, and there's always like a, I always know it's going to be like solid and also loose. So yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the lesson. That's the challenge. I balance those two things, you know. Solid and loose. Yeah, just, you know, tight, but also, you know, you can go anywhere, and there's an openness to it. Yeah. So, that's what that's you want. A, yeah. That's what you what wish you for. Yeah, not too loose. <laughs> yeah. You know, and not too tight either. Yeah. You know, great. They're both. Uh, you know. Yeah, but it's a it's a it's a blessing to be able to I mean, you know, to be able to somehow be still playing together after 30 years. Mm. It's just it's a miracle logistically that it can still happen and mm -hmm. still doing it. And hey, why not? Yeah. So,